So I've had some people reach out and just kind of ask me like what resources I've commonly used in my journey for healing. Um, you know, I really love Pat Carnes and Robert Weiss. They are both experts in the field of sex addiction. Pat Carnes was kind of like the original, he wasn't even a whistleblower, but he was kind of the, the man who came up with the term and started this movement of educating people on sex addiction. And then Robert Weiss studied under him, but they're both just amazing to listen to. I actually have a video on my channel. It is an hour long, but if you listen to it, that was so healing for me and validating for me in a different way than any video on narcissism or abuse ever was. And I think it's because, um, you know, throughout my entire life, like I've talked on my channel about how I had cycles of abuse and continual experiences and essentially uh, exploitive relationships. And the thing that I never really found addressed in videos on narcissism or psychological abuse is the aspect of sex, more so my sexual dynamic with these men. And that really was at the epicenter of the relationship. I mean, it was it was such a thing. It was just such a thing because so many of these men, I, I realize now, were sex addicts. But I didn't have a term for it back then. And so, you know, I studied narcissism, I studied things on psychopaths, but none of it really touched on this wound. And it was a huge wound inside of me, how I perceived what sex was supposed to be like, um, how I thought men were supposed to be. And I think why listening to Pat Carnes and Robert Weiss was so healing for me and so validating for me is because they are the experts. They are the experts in this area of sex addiction. And so to hear two different men basically say, no, this is what dysfunction looks like. And here is the term for it. And it is a sex addict. And then to hear them essentially describe these men that I had been involved with who had convinced me to consider their behavior normal, to hear an expert in the field of sex addiction sort of say indirectly to the audience, no, this is not normal and you're not required to find this normal. And it's actually here are all the places that it comes from and really explain it to me in a way that I've never seen any other video explain it to me. I mean, if you go and you watch that or just look up them up on YouTube, they have lots of lectures, both of them. That really helped me stop being tormented inside about whether I should be okay with this stuff or not. I mean, that really put a, a nail in the coffin, the final nail in the coffin where I was like, thank you for putting out this information. And, and the other part of it that, you know, they acknowledge that Robert Weiss specifically in one of the videos I found by him, he literally says, therapists, you need to be asking your clients about their sex lives more. Like it is a completely untouched area that is not addressed. I mean, the minute I go on a date from the very first date, this is something that is in play is the dynamic of sex, the question of sex, the conversation of sex, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, how soon it's going to happen. I mean, it is absolutely the elephant in the room of sorts. It's what people are looking for. It's what people are thinking needs to be sought. I mean, it is the thing that relationships are centered around. This was what so much of the abuse and the um, exploitation and just the breaking down of myself centered around was how I gave them sex, how soon I gave them sex, what I did in sex that I didn't actually really want to do that much, but I wanted the man to stay. I wanted the person I was dating to stay. And so I would continually compromise on my boundaries and my values in how I had sex with them. And then that would create um, feelings of shame inside of me, a loss of identity. There was just a continual breaking down of myself through the way that sex existed in the relationship, the way it was demanded of me, how often it was asked for me to give it. And, and so to hear experts in sex addiction kind of validate for me that that is not what 
healthy sex is like and that that is the the ways that it was asked of me and the frequency that it was asked of me is literally what sex addiction is that was that was so healing for me they encourage women to be in sex therapy and he talks about uh robert weiss opened i think maybe one of the only kind of clinics that's for women i don't think i really truly understood how much society is normalizing sex addiction until i listened to these guys talk and then because they are the experts, they are the ones who watch how this is truly horrible for people long term, specifically even just for the sex addicts themselves. Um, you know, they're the ones that watch how this plays out and how this crashes and burns and how this is unhealthy for people long term. They're the ones observing it. So listening to them just gave me this term, which is sex addiction, and really just made me realize that society is ignorantly treating something like it's normal that isn't and ignorantly treating something like it's sustainable long term when it's not it's not sustainable long term and and the experts are the ones who would know that and and understand that because they watch and observe this stuff burn out and destroy lives every single day yes i'm in my pajamas sue me i always forget to say something but the thing that i forgot to say is that you know listening to them also helped free me from thinking that I was the, the reason that they were never satisfied sexually. Like when you're truly dealing with an addict, they can never be satisfied. You can never be kinky enough. You can never give them enough. You could literally have sex with them five times a day, multiple times a day, every single day, and it's never enough because they are an addict. And you could never be kinky enough for them because just like with every addict, they like things when they're new, they like things when they're taboo, and they like to get higher and higher and higher off their drug. And after you have been a consistent partner to them for a long enough period of time, you are no longer that new kinky thing. It's impossible to stay new forever and it's impossible to be taboo forever if you're in a relationship with them so it really freed me from that illogical belief that i had this helped me understand that i can't fix them that it doesn't matter how long i sat around trying to satisfy them sexually i could not fix their addiction i could not be the solution to all of their unhappiness which a lot of times because they're addicts and they didn't understand that they were addicts they would act like somehow it was possible for me to satisfy all of it and fix all of their unhappiness and it was it was just me not doing X, Y, and Z things sexually that was the source of their unhappiness and that was the problem in their relationship and listening to Robert and Patrick talk like really helped me understand that that's not the case. That's just what addicts say, but really the source of the unhappiness was them and their addiction. So it really, it separated me from that desire to try to fix people in the future or even believe that I could fix someone in the future. And it also helped me spot it faster on dates. I can spot aspects of sexual addiction faster on dates and that's another reason why I don't want to date anyone who is actively watching porn all the time because the likelihood of them being a sex addict in some form fucking skyrockets if that factor is present. Does that suck? Yeah, because a lot of people are addicted to porn today. It's really unfortunate. But I would literally rather be single and alone than dating someone with a sexual addiction. Like, like I'm not gonna put myself through that torture. If I had to summarize what I see happening between boys and girls in the aftermath of this stuff, it's that boys tend to get addicted to porn and we tend to get addicted to them. And so the men are addicted to essentially what is uh, an object, which is the porn, and we are essentially addicted to a man who is addicted to an object, something outside of us, you know? And so they're chasing something while we chase them, and everybody's fucking unhappy. I think that is the most confusing part of abuse is like unpacking what really was my choice, what really was the thing that I wanted, or what was the thing that I just convinced myself that I wanted because they wanted it from me. And that that's a really personal thing that you have to go through with a trusted person. That's not something you like process with strangers on the internet. Um, but yeah, so if you really want to understand your abuse from a, a different place that I think sex, sex is just such an aspect to this stuff.
The other resource that I strongly recommend people check out, and I've already mentioned it in a short that I posted uh, earlier this week, I think, but enmeshment, studying enmeshment, specifically Jerry Weiss. I guess all these people have the last name Weiss. Uh, I just realized that, but Jerry Weiss, he, I'll put a link to his YouTube channel down below. So informative. And he discusses it from the aspect of like addiction almost and getting like sober in a different way and cultivating yourself. And he really addresses the, how you almost don't have a sense of self. And his videos are very therapeutic for me without even like going to therapy. I can listen to his stuff and I just, he has such a poignant way of describing things. Um, I love how he describes things and he, out of all the different people, because I've listened to several different people who are experts on enmeshment, Ken Adams is another one and he's really great to listen to, but Jerry Weiss is my favorite because he talks about it from the standpoint of almost like uh, an addiction and how also with addicts, addicts of other things like substance abuse and stuff like that, you do walk away when you first start getting sober, you walk away feeling like you don't have a sense of self. Not all feelings are equal. For example, if dad says you're not doing it right, why can't you do what I told you? You feel shame. The shame is not equivalent to feeling shame when I have truly hurt someone. The second is true shame. If I've hurt someone, then shame is an appropriate feeling and is a normal and true feeling. The first shame is the family brain shame or system shame intended to diminish you or get you to comply. It's what I call false shame. It's a shame generated by the relationship emotional field to keep the system operating in a dysfunctional way. Or another way to put it is uh, their relationship-fueled feelings. You need to work on your self-esteem and your self-confidence. My experience, most clients do not have a good idea about how to do this. I certainly didn't. We know we need to do this and that this is important, but when we don't change or fall into the same low self-esteem rut, we feel shame and guilt and we also blame ourselves. It just must be us. I'm just worthless or I'm no good or I can't mature. I can't recover. I'm just a child. We have all of these negative criticisms we throw at ourselves. Most of us adult children grew up other-focused. I'm not talking about other-focused in terms of empathy. I'm talking about mental and emotional orientation that's other-focused. We participated in the family brain, other-focused, the family super-self, other-focused, and never developed to self. So when you ask someone to work on their self-esteem, it's like asking a fish to go and find some clearer water to swim in. And they respond, what is water? And his videos really are about how to cultivate a sense of self with yourself. And he even acknowledges that while enmeshment is usually discussed in terms of family systems and family dynamics, he absolutely uh, acknowledges that this is an aspect of abuse as well. And I think, you know, for anybody who's following this channel, I always assume that most of the people are abuse survivors, but the most um, impactful aspect, I think, of the abuse process is our ourselves, our sense of self being broken down so that really only one person's sense of self is left and that is the, the person controlling the relationship. And so a lot of times when I would leave these relationships, I didn't really have hobbies because all, all of my needs centered around their needs, right? And I just constantly got, got rid of my morals, compromised on my morals, compromised on my personality, changed myself to be whatever they wanted me to be. And so studying enmeshment has also been incredibly healing for me. And that is another thing that I never really had therapists talking to me about or discussing as um, an aspect of abuse that does occur and how we are left without a sense of self. And the last thing that I strongly, strongly encourage everyone to do is join a sobriety group. And it doesn't matter if it's for substance abuse. It doesn't fucking matter. When I got sober through AA, there were people in the rooms 
for like food addiction and stuff. Addiction is addiction. And what you would be surprised to learn is how similar all addictions are. You just change the word and the behaviors are basically the same. The secretive behaviors, the way that we hide our addiction, the way we're ashamed of our addiction, the way that we assume no one else will, will understand the embarrassing things that we did to get the high that we were craving from whatever our drug was. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I know for myself and for a lot of the other women I meet in my life who are survivors, we are truly addicted to whatever aspect of abuse and to narcissists and this kind of cycle of highs and lows in the merry-go-round cycle of abuse. And so I didn't understand any of that at the time when I got sober. When I got sober, it was for alcohol, you know? I And, and so I didn't learn how helpful these tools were until later uh, but learning the tools that helped me stay sober from alcohol a thousand percent to this day helped me stay sober from unhealthy men and unhealthy relationships i literally took all those tools in my toolbox that i picked up for for something else and i used those for so many different aspects of my life today and there's something that i really the reason i really like aa is because that fourth step of writing out your grievances and sharing them with a trusted person, your sponsor. You know, the reason people are so terrified of writing out their fourth step is because what you're writing out is things that you essentially assume you're going to be judged for. Just to, to read off of what it actually is, the fourth step is doing a, a searching and fearless moral inventory. And so your moral inventory is essentially going through like the metaphorical warehouse of yourself, taking stock, uh, making a list of, of things inside of you that you think need to be improved upon. Looking at your good and your bad traits, things where you fucked up in the past and, and stuff like that, and basically admitting it to another person. It's basically a different per version of like confession. And I think confession of the soul is like so healing. In AA, they say that secrets keep us sick. And I've absolutely seen that. And I've seen that in people that I've watched relapse. I've seen that in myself. You know, when you keep something a secret from the shame that you feel, it really does keep you sick. And it's a lot of reasons why people like relapse because they try and talk themselves through the shit. But it's hard to talk yourself through something while you're craving something. This is where I basically started using trusted people more to like, admit the shit going on in my head after I, I saw and experienced for the first time someone not judging me when I told them the fucked up shit in my head. And, and that's really what I'm getting at, at least in AA. I don't know about other sobriety programs. I can't speak for them. I haven't done them. But at least in AA, that is life changing for the brain. And I've seen how much it's impacted not just me, but other people getting sober is taking that mo lit, that moral inventory list, admitting it to someone else, and then watching that someone doesn't judge you, they accept you how you are. It's like a giant burden lifted off of you. And I've seen that a lot in my conversations with other survivors as well. When they, when they realize that they are able to admit to me that they are addicted to someone who's not good for them, and they see that I don't consider them disgusting or like they lack value or worth in any kind of way, I can see the burden lift off of them then too. And, and it's necessary and important to have these conversations, but it's also the other part of getting sober that I really respect AA for is it doesn't just encourage you to pity yourself you have to take accountability for your side of the street. And this doesn't come down to like, how is it your fault that you were raped? It's not that. It's looking at your lifestyle and the ways that maybe you're constantly pursuing your own version of an addiction to help you stay sober. And so, you know, some people might not be ready for that part of their journey, but if you're really look, if you're really wondering what pieces of my life got me to where I am today, I'm just letting you know that going through a sobriety program, taking honest moral inventory of myself, and then also learning that it's not just always everybody else's fault, that there were things that I was doing and it wasn't my fault that the bad things came through those people. It wasn't my fault that the evil shit came through those fuckers. It wasn't my fault that they were sex addicts. That's not what I'm taking, taking accountability for. What I was taking accountability for was my addiction to these men and my inability to like leave them. And where I hold myself accountable today is staying sober from those types of people and changing the way that I live my life so that I don't 
relapse on those types of people. I hope I hope that makes sense and that I'm like kind of distinguishing between those two points because they are two completely different mindsets. One is like saying it's your fault that somebody treated you like shit. And one is just saying, what can I do to avoid relapsing on what is essentially my drug? Those are those are two completely different mindsets. The best thing that my sponsor ever said to me was that if you look for the differences between your story and someone else's, you will find them. Because when I first got into the AA rooms, I was comparing my story to everybody else's. Well, they hit their bottom, their, their bottom of, you know, it's called your bottom because that's basically like the worst point you hit in your life where you realize that everything's fucked up and you need to change. I, you know, everybody hits their bottom in different ways. And I was finding myself comparing my bottom to other people's bottoms and going, well, I never went to jail. I never got arrested, you know, just comparing. Um, but she said, if you always look for the differences, you'll find them. But if you look for the similarities between your story and someone else's, you will find that. And that really helped me change my perspective to where, you know, when I went into the rooms, I wasn't looking for like how my story was different from everybody else's. And I really did start hearing how similar our lives were, even if our bottoms were different and our journeys were different in different ways. Like the shame is always the same. The, the, the horrible secrecy that we experience from our mistakes is the same. The cravings are the same. How we deal with the cravings are the same. The relapses feel the same. You know, a lot of that, that internal structure uh, for how we deal with all that stuff is very similar. I've been editing this video and my hair is dry now, but I did want to include this last part because it wouldn't, it, I would be remiss if I didn't include it. And that is that another huge resource that I picked up along the way was prayer and a relationship with God. And you can roll your eyes at that if you want to. It's okay. I'm not, you know, shoving my religion on anyone, but it is a fact that I used to be a completely different person. And you just have to take my word for it. People who used to know me back then know that I am a different person today. I was someone who was angry. I was bitter. I suffered from chronic, chronic depression that I couldn't control for a majority of my life. Um, I didn't really have any insight into the things that I'd been through. I was confused. I didn't know how to process any of it. I had you know, all of this stuff inside of me that felt like I've said in other videos felt like a fire burning inside of me that I didn't know how to put out. And when I have started praying and as I've developed a relationship with God, I have been shocked, genuinely shocked at the things that have changed inside of me. And it didn't happen overnight. It happened over the course of years. You know, in my opinion, God works slowly. He changes hearts slowly because these, these other things that happened through my grooming, they also grew slowly inside of me as well. And so to undo that takes time. And I think it's a kind way of approaching things because sometimes intense change is shocking and scary. And I'm okay with the fact that it takes time to change. But I have watched my heart change. I have watched my heart soften. I have watched the bitterness fade away. I have watched the depression disappear, which is crazy. I never thought that I would be able to say something like that. And I have, God has really granted me he's been merciful enough. I, I consider it a blessing uh, and it's humbling to see what God has revealed to me about my past, about myself. He's given me the ability to forgive people, which is freeing for me. It doesn't mean I have to be their best friend again, but it frees me from them. And he's really given me the ability to forgive people, to accept myself, to accept others. I, I am, I feel grateful for the life that I have today and prayer and a relationship with God is absolutely a part of what has gotten me where I'm at today. And so when people ask me that question, that is absolutely a part of my answer. So those are my biggest resources. I hope that might be of help to you guys somehow. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you have all these people making documentaries and movies and stuff on like abuse and narcissism and trafficking and like all of that stuff's great. But these are the areas that I don't hear being discussed uh, for, for survivors. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we are left to fix ourselves. 
is that unfortunate? Yeah, but at the same time, we're not born into a world where everybody, we're promised a world where other people fix our problems for us anyway. It's always ultimately our job to fix our own problems. Uh, and so it is, it's our responsibility to fix ourselves. We're kind of left to fix ourselves. And I just see as much as people are learning more about what all this looks like, the aftermath of all this looks like, um, these are the areas that I just don't see people always knowing are existing inside of a survivor. I don't think some people realize how much the survivor lacks a sense of self, or that they have complicated residual um, relationships to sex is how I would say that. I don't know if people are always aware of that. And I don't know if people are always aware of the fact that we are addicted to this stuff, that our brain has been rewired because it's really, I think people want a success story, right? You rescue someone from a situation and you just want them to be fucking good now, right? They People love a success story, but oftentimes there's, after our initial period of abuse, there's a lot of messiness that occurs in whatever form on our end before we finally start getting to the point of recovery. Because a lot of times we don't even know what kind of messiness is inside of us. We don't have the words for it. You know, I didn't even know the term enmeshment until like eight months ago. I didn't know anything about sex addicts until about 12 months ago, about a year ago. This is all very new for me too because I didn't even think to, I didn't have words for any of it. And because I didn't have words for any of it, I didn't know how to look any of it up. I just knew that I didn't feel like I had a self. And I knew that in a lot of my relationships, somehow the, the sexual dynamic between me and the men always seemed to somehow be them needing a lot of sex from me that I didn't want to provide in the ways or in the amount or in the frequency that they wanted it. And I didn't have terms for that. And so these are the terms that I found and hopefully those terms are of help to you guys as well. Anyway, as always, thank you for watching my videos and God bless.